Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to the British Library food season and in particular this event for uh, Feeding the World, Farming the Planet. I'm Angela Clutton, I'm one of the co-directors of the food season and together with Melissa Thompson and our curator Polly Russell we've worked on putting this season together uh, and welcome too to our online audience, we have people joining us via that way too. Um, we have a little lineup change, Abby Allen from Piper's Farm is sadly unable to be with us tonight but we do have Peter Gregg who is the founder of Piper's Farm so we are, we are all set. Um, a cracking panel and a cracking chair, Dimitri Hutar, who is the BBC's Rural Affairs Champion. Uh, if you've heard much on BBC Radio 4 or sounds to do with rural affairs, food, natural history or the environment, there's a very strong chance that Dimitri has had something to do with that. He's passionate about food, food production and the environment, so I think we couldn't be in better hands for this very, very interesting and important conversation tonight. Dimitri, over to you. Thank you. I'll start here. Um, Thank you, uh, and thank you for all of you for uh, joining, us, uh, joining us here tonight, uh, and for those of you following us online as well. Uh, and thank you to the British Library as well for organizing uh, an amazing range of talks. Um, what should we feed ourselves? How should we grow food? How do we ensure that the, we grow food sustainably and without destroying the planet? How do we stop the giant biodiversity decline? All those questions, in my opinion, are probably the most important and pressing issues society needs to resolve. Um, if you go on Twitter, you probably find quite a few people who seem to know what the answer should be. Uh, but social media uh, has favored highly polarized debates where, to be heard, many of the answers seem to have to be black or white. And tonight, I, I hope we can go a bit further than this because uh, I'm sure everybody here knows that. Uh, the answers, uh, as ever, are much more nuanced. Um, in the UK, um, those questions are crucial, especially because around 70% of our land is used uh, for agriculture, but only 13% of our UK land is covered by forest. This compared to around 39% uh, in the EU. Globally, food production as a whole contributes to around a third of global uh, emission. Um, and so looking at our diet and how we farm is key if we want to have any chance to get to net zero by 2050. And, and if you like me, this, this brings some uh, huge personal dilemma. I, I love food, I love feeding people, I love feeding friends and family, I love cooking, I love eating, especially a good steak. Um, my wife is Brazilian and uh, we just love, love to put an entire cut of meat on the barbecue, a picanha on the churrasco. Uh, it's delicious, but the moral dilemma each time I eat a steak is really difficult. Um, am I contributing to climate change? Even the choice of charcoal is an issue. Uh, but globally, two-thirds of land used for food production is actually used for grazing animals, and a lot of the rainforest that is being cut down is, grown, uh, is to grow soya to feed um, livestock. Then on top of that, we have the biodiversity crisis, the cost of living crisis, which makes uh, which makes it for many very difficult to uh, feed uh, their family properly. Food inflation grew by 17% last year. Uh, we have the war in Ukraine destabilizing the global food chain. We have the effect of Brexit, uh, which affects access to farm seasonal labor. Uh, we have the effect of uh, climate change, which was partly responsible for the tomato and cucumber shortage we had a few weeks ago. Um, but then another dilemma I've got after saying all that is I'm currently do, in the middle of uh, doing some uh, academic research on how best engage your audience in those issues. And um, the, 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 the empirical research is quite clear, the results are quite clear. Doom and gloom is a switch off uh, and we need to be more fun. So with that in mind, in an effort to bring a bit of fun to the party, uh, uh, I'm going to ask my panel to uh, play along with my favourite game, Death Row Dinner. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, imagine you're on death row, what is going to be your last meal that you're going to be requesting. So first on our panel, we've got uh, Henry Dimbleby, as you know, the author of the National Food Strategy. He also published his highly acclaimed book, uh, Ravenous. He was a death row non-exec director, but resigned a few weeks ago uh, after what he called an insane lack of action on obesity. Uh, he's the co-founder of the restaurant chain Leon. 
He's co he co-founded uh, Chefs in School, which aims to improve uh, school lunches and food education. And he has been a journalist for The Telegraph. And he also was a commie chef at the Michelin star restaurant early in his career. Henry, what's your death row meal? I'm <coughs> not sure I'd be that hungry on death row, to be honest. But I guess it would, um, <laughs> it would probably have to be uh, some just delicious Sri Lankan curry with lots of turmeric and lime and, and maybe some eggs in it as well. Um, Dr. Tara Garnett is a researcher at the University of Oxford uh, whose work looks at how the food system can become uh, sustainable and resilient and ultimately good. She is the director of Table, uh, a global platform looking at the future of food. Uh, Table is a collaboration between the University of Oxford, the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and Wageningen uh, University in the Netherlands. Tara, you death row meal? Well, I'm going to answer it in two ways. So uh, probably a, a Greek or Cypriot mezze, because I'm half Cypriot, and it would be something like that. Um, but the other way I'd answer it is it would probably be um, crab, because um, I used to eat it. I love it. I'm now very allergic to it, but it wouldn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Nick Saltmarsh is the co-founder of Hot Madots, who works to increase diversity on farms and in the food uh, we eat for the benefit of farming, the landscape, the environment, individual health and our food culture. Bringing beans back to the British kitchen proved to be the catalyst to build a network of farmers who started diversifying the, their arable rotation by introducing pulse, grain and seed. Uh, Nick and Hot Madots won uh, best food producer at arguably the most pre prestigious uh, food accolades, uh, the BBC Food and Farming Awards. Uh, Nick, your death row meal. Uh, well, I think I'd need something very comforting, and there's nothing more comforting than a bowl of dal. So I'd have a dal made with British split peas, of course. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, Peter Grigg from uh, Papa's Farm. Papa's Farm is a 50-acre permanent pasture family farm located in Devon. Uh, Peter believes in working in harmony with uh, the natural landscape. With his wife Henry, they uh, are determined to produce the very best of meat, which means they farm in symbiosis with the environment in a way uh, that promote carbon sequestration and increased biodiversity. Um, once I was sitting next to Peter uh, at a dinner and I asked him uh, if his food was organic, and he replied, Dimitri, my food is not organic, it's orgasmic. <laughs> Maybe you can expand on that li later. Peter, <laughs> what is your death row meal? Thanks, Dimitri. Well remembered. Um, yeah, it's cooked on a fire pit using some uh, very, very local Exeter charcoal. It would be scallops hand-ived out of Lime Bay, followed by a piece of picana from our red ruby beef that's been eating this stuff all its life. Yeah, and the vegetables thrown on the fire pit as well. Dreamy. Uh, I'm coming with you. Um, um, so there, um, so I, I will, will, I'm going to start by asking a few questions. I, I will come to the audience uh, to get a, a few questions a bit later as well, probably in the, the last half hour. Uh, if you do want to ask a question, please make it a question and not a political statement, otherwise I will uh, stop you um, and try to make it brief so we can go through quite a lot of them. Uh, if you're following us online, there's a Q&A uh, option and you can put your question in there and hopefully they will appear on the iPad here. Um, and also feel uh, free to use social media to comment and share your thoughts. Uh, the hashtag is BLFoodSeason and uh, most of us on the panel are on Twitter. Um, Henry, if I can start with you. Uh, we know one to use all land to produce foods, to sequestrate carbon, uh, to improve biodiversity. Um, is it really possible for farmers to do all this and improve soil at the same time? Um, it is. So I think it's a very good way of framing it. If you, you know, up until the late 18th, early 19th century, we used sunlight on the land to produce everything we needed, to produce the clothes that we wear, the material for our buildings, our food, uh, so on and so forth. And then <coughs> we discovered millions of years of trapped sunlight in the form of fossil fuels. And through the kind of 18th century and into the 19th, 20th century, sorry, through the 19th century into the 20th, 21st century, we basically used 
fossil fuels to not only produce the materials for clothes, but produce all the energy we need, it, and we've used um, the land to create food. And we're now in a situation where we actually need to ask more of the land again. So you, it's like solving a simultaneous equation. Can we produce enough food to feed ourselves, sequester carbon and restore biodiversity using the same amount of land? And the answer is yes, but only if we stop wasting as much. And that's not just the food that we throw away, it's how we farm. So often a lot, a lot of the most destructive farms farm unproductively and we need to farm more productively. But also, and you mentioned it in your introduction, 85% of the land that we use to feed ourselves here in the UK is used either to graze animals or to grow plants to feed to animals. And that is a very inefficient way of creating food. And we need some of that land back. And just to end by giving a scale to which animal agriculture has taken over the world, the animals that we rear to feed us at any one time now weigh twice as much as all of the human beings on the planet and 20 times as much as um, all of the wild animals, land-dwelling land vertebrates and birds. So I'm not a vegan, I'm not vegetarian. It's just we are eating way too much meat and we need to take some of the pressure off. We need some of that land back to do other things. Well, I've, I've, I'm sure we'll come back to the subject of meat later on. Uh, but Tara, we table you. You've been really investigating how we should produce food sustainably, bringing academic rigor to your work. Um, what are some of the, the key findings you've you have found? I mean, I, I, think, I think just to, to echo what, what Henry's been saying, we have a, a growing global population um, with increasingly resource-intensive demands. We have finite land that has to do more and more things, and we, we need to somehow square the circle. And I think um, if we have to make some big decisions as a, as a global society, we have to decide what's really, really important. And to give my personal opinions, what I think is really, really important is that we feed people adequate, nutritious food and we protect um, other living things. We, we make space for the non-human world. And if we are to achieve both, and I think we can just about to do it, but what does need to take a hit is our assumption that we can have anything we want in any quantities we want, any time or day or like we want, and the consequences uh, be damned. And I think that's what we really, really need to need to be addressing. And there will be difficult questions to, uh, there will be a difficult jug juggling act between how much land we appropriate for ourselves and for our needs and what we, what we retain for wild creatures and the extent to which we can share land with other species. And the answer is going to be different for different parts of the world. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Peter, um, regenerative agriculture is now branded by many politicians, business, farmers, uh, as the solution for farming uh, and Piper's Farm, it, it probably wasn't called region agriculture at the beginning, but it, it, are you doing region agriculture? Is, the, is what you do region agriculture? And, and if so, so, how do you define it? Because there, there's no agreed definition of region originally. Yeah, as, as you um, alluded to in your remarks earlier about me not wanting to use the word organic, Dimitri, I'm equally averse to using the word regenerative, just because it's become a contemporary label and it's trying to box everything into something that isn't nuanced. Again, as you talked about earlier, this is a highly complex discussion and a very finely balanced argument. But I think a couple of points Henry made are spot on. He referred to the fact that pre-industrialized agriculture, we harvested the energy of the sun to produce food. Productivity was about using the sun's energy efficiently. Tara has talked about good nutrition. That's, they're the basic building blocks. It's why I brought a lump of the farm, <laughs> because inside that bit of Piper's farm, 
there are many hundreds of times the number of bacteria there are human beings on the planet. So, so to even begin to think that as an industry producing food, we should not really treasure and respect and harness the, the unbelievable power that goes on in the soil because they're the ones who convert sun's energy into food. And if our gut health is aligned to the soil biology, it delivers nutritious food. So I'm not good on these sort of labels, I'm afraid, but if you want to say, are we regenerative? I'd say back to the future is, I mean, yeah, it's back to the future. Let's go back to when it was basic building blocks of food systems and farming. We won't be far wrong. Nick, um, you know, we, we talk about we need to, to change our, our food system. Is it our responsibility as an individual to, to make those change? Or whose responsibility is it? And what, what kind of change do we need to achieve? So we do need significant change in the food system from farming right through to what we eat as, as individuals. And, and those two things obviously have to go hand in hand. We need change in farming and we need dietary change as well for the sake of the environment, but also for the sake of our, our health and nutrition. And, and one incredibly fortunate thing that I think we should be really grateful for is that those two things, uh, farming for the environment and eating for our health and nutrition, they do go hand in hand. It's, it's the same changes can achieve both of those aims. Uh, I would resist, though, the, the idea that it's incumbent and the responsibility lies entirely with us as individuals or, or as consumers, as we're you know, often called, which is a word that, that I hate. We're, <coughs> we're not just consumers, we're people, we're individuals. We eat, we share food, we grow food. We, we're all part of a, a giant food web rather than being discrete um, components in some simplistic food chain. It's not our responsibility. We need to be part of the change but for the system to change, we need wider political change. We need the businesses that work within that system and choose the food that is made available to us in the shops. Um, it, it's very convenient for them to say that everything is down to consumer choice, but our choice is only what we're faced with in the shops largely. And, and as individuals, we, we can be very powerless in, in shaping that. So we need the businesses to change and, and to enable that, we really need political change. We need the government to have the courage to take responsibility for the food that we eat and the way that the food we eat is produced. And it is continually disappointing that successive governments fail to, to rise to this challenge. And well, I'm sure Henry has, has seen this close up, <laughs> that uh, governments can be presented with fantastic ideas and proposals, and yet taking those ideas <coughs> and converting them into policy that will actually drive change in the in the food and farming system never seems to happen and, and we need to collectively agitate for, for governments to take on that responsibility. Henry, I, mean, I, I think Nick is, is probably right that to, to achieve systematic, cha systematic change, the, the, the best way I think history shows us that is through legislation. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the, the 5p tax on the uh, carrier bag, was hugely successful. You know, the amount of plastic use and plastic bag use completely decreased. Why, why is government so... <coughs> you, you were there at DEFRA for yeah. uh, six years. Yeah, so you need, you actually need a combination of legislation and love. So uh, government intervention is necessary, but it is not sufficient. And there are fundamentally two things that are going, or two feedback loops that are going wrong in, in the food system. One is on the health side, and in the book and the food strategy we call it the junk food cycle, which is the fact that our, our evolved appetite is in a toxic feedback loop with the corporate incentives of companies, and we're not talking about that today, but that is, if we don't deal with it, it's going to bring down the NHS and make us impoverished and sick. On the environmental <coughs> side, uh, Partha Das Gupta, uh, in his econ Economics of, Bio of Biodiversity, described the invisibility of nature. So what he pointed out was that nature not only is hard sometimes to quantify, it's invisible, it's mobile, it's silent, but also that all of the systems that we use to measure human success don't include nature. So you can't 
count it in your wallet, it's not in the balance sheet of companies, it's not in the GDP. And in fact, it's worse than that. We don't give a zero cost. We actually incentivize companies. Government pays companies. Globally, governments pay companies about $500 billion uh, a year to destroy nature, causing about to, with um, in, uh, fo to payments to fossil fuel companies, to farming companies, to fishermen. And that caused about four to six trillion dollars of damage. So you need fundamentally to change the incentives in that system. At the moment, you make much more money farming in a destructive way because we have basically, for our economic growth has been formed off the back of, we've just been borrowing from nature. And there's, an, there's a terrifying equation in Descriptor's report where he basically shows that the current path leads to extinction. Mathematically, if we carry on as we are now, we destroy nature and we become extinct. So why just oh, so, so that's kind of, that's the <laughs> that's the that's the context. So given that, why is it so hard? It's so hard because there are vested interests. So if you look, actually, the government is doing nothing. It's going backwards on health. It's an absolute disaster. But on the environmental side, there actually we have structurally the right approach, which is to pay money for public goods, not for farming, to raise the level of regulation. The, the trade policy is a disaster, but we, we may or may not come to that. Thanks to Liz Trust. <laughs> um, <laughs> but every step of the way, they are lobbied by different players in the system who throw grit into the gears, who shed obfuscation, and any misstep is, uh, is treated by the press as if the world has changed. And if you're trying to change a complex system in that kind of environment, when actually you don't really know, you have to kind of play with it, it's very, very difficult for governments. And it requires a combination of both uh, visionary politicians who can, who can explain this is what the future is going to look like and this is uh, what, what we need to happen, plus people who are all over the detail. And that is a, a breed of politician that is very rare and we certainly haven't had it in our last two prime ministers. Um, maybe things will be a bit better over the next few years and after the next election we'll see. But it's, um, it is a difficult thing. It requires <coughs> skillful politicians and we don't have those in high, s high, high numbers. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a shit job, right? I mean, I wouldn't want to do it, but I mean, sorry, excuse my language. Um, Ta Tara, have you, uh, have you found some in the research you've done, because you, you do research not just in the UK, but globally. Is that, have you found some, some example of where it's been working? Well, I don't think there's really a single country where obesity levels have been, I mean, the, um, the Finland example gets used a lot as an example of a, of a country where uh, public health problems of heart disease have been overturned by um, strong concerted government action. Um, but, but more or less, everything seems to be going backwards and I think you know the other thing there was a there was a Finland example a bunch of very unhealthy men who were um, eating sort of butter with meat more or less and and the government stepped Salt. in and introduced um, fruit and vegetable production schemes and got them uh, adding vegetables to their meals and all the rest of it and and heart disease went down etc etc but that was a strong government um, with a I guess in a society with some faith in the state, uh, a sort of culture, culturally homogeneous society. Lots and lots of issues were, were quite different from the situation we're in today. We have, and I'm just going back to, to your point about how you hate the, the, the word consumer. I really hate it as well. But we have, s we, the, the worst of it is that we, we think that we are, and we think that's all we are. And I think in addition to visionary leadership, we need a collective sense that we are more than mouths and wallets, that we, we, we are a, a kind of community of, of citizens um, with the possibility of having other goals than just going shopping. And so, but that's very, very hard, um, very hard to achieve. And I think the other thing that's really hard to achieve is um, is a sense that you know, as soon as as soon as uh, a, a member of the government, a, a policymaker, dares to to 
to make noises about regulation. Um, the headline lines are nanny state, nanny state, you're going to take our burgers away from us, whatever, whatever it might be. And, and I think we have, our, uh, we have a real problem as a society with getting our heads around the idea of subtlety, that, that if one says something like, you need to eat less meat, then suddenly no one is ever allowed to eat any animal <laughs> product ever again. When in fact what we're talking about is gradations and modifications and it's not a be all and end all. But, but the debates and the discussions become very, very polarised and, and, and nothing, nothing gets moved forward. But Henry, in, in some of the focus group you've done, I think you, you found out that uh, the public in general would be in favor, except for meat, the yeah. public actually would be in favor of those, those kind of things. Yeah, there's, there's a big misunderstanding, and it's, it's on both sides. So we've got the Tories who, you know, uh, in the book we talk about the fact that <coughs> the, the phrase nanny state was invented in this country in the 60s when most of the ruling class had been brought up by nannies and had ambivalent feelings about them. Um, <laughs> uh, and so they find it complicated, the idea of intervening. But the... Labour now, because they're so frightened of the Red Wall, uh, they, they are begin they're beginning to talk about junk food as if it's some kind of patriot patriotic act to eat brown food, and they're nervous. And actually, they've got it completely, completely wrong. Funny enough, I was talking to an old uh, uh, kind of Labour grandee this morning who thinks they've got it completely wrong and is going to go and talk to them about it. But basically, if you go to the Red Wall, as we did, if you go to Thanet, if you go to areas where people are really struggling with diet-related disease, they are fed up with having junk food bombarded at their children. They want intervention. And so, again, it t it, it, the, 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 the road through to policy intervention in that area is there. It needs someone to make the case. Andy Haldane, who is the former chief economist at the Bank of England, not a left-wing firebrand, made a speech a few weeks ago saying that the number one thing holding back growth in this country is, be, is, is the ill health of our population. The number one cause of that non-communicable disease is diet-related disease. And so what that looks like, as I said, is all the money getting sucked into the NHS and tax receipts going down. It is an absolute disaster. And whatever government is in place in 10 years' time, of whatever colour, is going to be dealing with that. And as Tara says, fundamentally we need to change the, the narrative on it because this idea that you know, we're, we all deserve our milkshake, or, or, as if that's even what it's about. It, it's nuts. It's completely nuts. Peter, do, do, do we value food in the UK? Um, a slightly indirect answer to your question, Dimitri, is uh, one of the reasons I'm a poor substitute for Abby tonight is last year she produced what I think was a fabulous book. And... It really is all about what you were just talking about there, Tara. The, the sort of, is steak and butter fundamentally a bad idea? And, and Nick was talking about all of the pulses and so on that Hodmer Dodds now produce. So Abby produced this book, which was inspired by growing up with her grandparents who had that very old-fashioned approach to how you fed yourselves. You wasted nothing Food was made from very basic building blocks. You know, meals were assembled from just individual items of food. People, you know, they had, there's that old saying, isn't it, that if your grandmother wouldn't recognise it as food, don't eat it. <laughs> and that's not far off the truth, because fundamentally then it's from a big corporate and it's ultra-processed. So... This idea, a bit like with the farming, we need to go back to the future and inspire and encourage the next generation to be excited by going using individual simple ingredients to feed themselves really well. And it is a myth, I think, that that sort of good, honest nutrition is expensive. Junk food is a dreadful investment. And as a nation, our culture around food isn't very good. But all I can say is our four-year-old grandson is the generation who don't take this sort of top-down, you've got to do this because we think we're going to make money out of you doing it. I think they're going to be a much more inquisitive, demanding generation 
who say, A, why are you screwing up the planet? And B, why are you persuading us to eat that rubbish? It, you know, that's the exciting positive outlook that I think the food culture in this country could move towards. Uh, Henry, do you think the, the currently the, the price of food reflects the true cost? And I, I mean, not just the cost of production, but also the environmental costs or even the social costs? No, it literally doesn't. It doesn't mean, so, uh, as part of the food strategy, we looked at, there are a lot of um, NGOs, non-governmental organisations, who've done costing for food. What would food actually cost if you add in the cost of treating ill health, the cost of the environment? And they all said, actually, uh, food would be about twice as expensive if you built that in. And I, I thought, when I saw that, I thought, oh, yeah, come on, that's just, uh, that's just campaigners, and they've taken the numbers, and they've given them a good spin. But actually, we had, I, mean, I had a civil service team of 20 people working for three years on this. And we, I think it, the cost of food is actually probably more than that. That's an underestimate. I don't think they estimate the health costs in there nearly in any of those estimates. So food currently, if you talk about the kind of the, the, the British economist Arthur Pigou, who invented uh, ex the taxes on externalities, food does not cover the cost of society. However... That does not mean that food has to be twice the cost because at the moment all of human ingenuity has gone into making high yielding crops, that's what they focused on, above anything else, and foods that we love and eat lots of that kill us. 85% of the food sold by um, processed food companies is, is unhealthy. If we focus, and this is where government intervention has to come in, if you make the incentives focused on creating environmentally friendly food that was healthy, I think other than meat, actually, you could argue that food wouldn't go up by a lot. I think it's quite difficult to produce meat if you put in uh, animal welfare in there without significantly increasing its cost, and that has political in incentives. So, yes, it is much cheaper than the real cost of production. No, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to double the cost of food. Uh, Tara, we, we, we've talked about the fact that... Uh, uh, livestock production takes so much of, of global lands. Um, should we just grow meat in a lab in factories and, uh, <coughs> and release the land to uh, help with biodiversity and tree planting? So th the simple answer is we shouldn't just do anything um, because I think, I mean, uh, the idea of going back to the future has a, a lot of appeal and I have a lot of sympathy for that idea, but but we are in a situation that is unprecedented at the moment. We're going to be perhaps 10 billion people on this planet. And the reason we are where we are today is because we were where we were in the past. The present is, to an extent, a response to the challenges of the past. And we, we developed our now um, disastrous food system because in many ways it... It, it felt like a solution to the problems of us running out of land, et cetera, et cetera, running out of nutrients for the land. And that's why we, you know, developed s s mineral fertilizers and all the rest of it. So, which, which, you know, every solution brings new problems and that's where we are. So this is a kind of long way around to saying that the past wasn't necessarily that great, certainly not for lots of people. Um, it, and so I think we need to um, have some faith in our ability to imagine ways forward while retaining um, the knowledge and the skills um, that, that we had in the past. So to, to get to your point on ferment, you know, microbial protein and lab-grown meat and all the rest of it, I don't think it's the solution. I think there are lots and lots of problems with it, partly um, to do with um, who is investing in it and the, the, the extent to which that if, this is, if this is the solution, then what is the problem? And the idea that the world needs more protein is very much open for discussion. Um, and the idea that the problems of hunger are... Uh, are, are to do with an absence and insufficiency of food, which, again, we know that it's, it's not so much that there isn't the food, it's th that people are not able to afford it 
or they don't have the means of production, so they're forced to rely on, on overseas. So, so the causes of hunger are very complex. So the idea that you invent a food and Bob's your uncle, that's your solution, is very, very questionable. That said, as Henry said, we're using vast, vast tracts of the world to rear animals, either directly for rearing them or indirectly to grow feeds to produce them. And land that is um, used for animals is, is, is not available for other wild things. Now, you can, um, many wild herbivores have been now substituted by grazing animals, and to, to some extent, in some parts of the world, they fulfill the same ecological functions as wild herbivores do, but um, we had those wild herbivores with a greater range of diversity than we do today. So insofar as you can take some livestock out of the system and free up land by using technologies such as microbial um, fermentation, then I think they can provide a certain part of the solution, but they they free ecological space for the sorts of grazing systems, the grazing production systems that, that, that you do so well, and they also uh, free up space for nothing at all to do with humans, which is, which is desperately needed. But, but they are not the answer because there is no single answer to a problem as horrifically and fantastically complex as, as that of the food system. I think it's just worth pointing out, just very briefly, Tara and I are constantly talking about land, and one of the misconceptions about meat is that it's about methane, and the methane produced by ruminants is a problem, but it is dwarfed by the problem of land use. So you see people <coughs> on Twitter getting angry about you know, the fact that methane falls out of the atmosphere after 12 years, etc., etc., etc. It is land that is the scarce resource here. <laughs> methane is important, but it's it, almost a side issue. And, and just to kind of emphasise, you can, you know, you look at fields with, with cows and sheep on it and you think there's so much nature coexisting with it. And in our landscapes that have been kind of managed by humans for so long, arguably the kinds of biodiversity that we value in this country are as a result of the kind of the coexistence of, of our livestock and, and, and those species. But there are other kinds of biodiversity that, that can only survive without our intervention in that respect. And that's definitely true of parts of you know, the global south, the Amazon, other parts which are being deforested because of, well, largely because of livestock um, and the feeds that they require. Uh, Peter, you, you operate quite an <coughs> extensive system. Um, should you just release your land for biodiversity? No. I, I'm really conscious, I think, in this part of our discussion that we need to make a very clear distinction between industrial food and food produced in harmony with nature. So, and, and that particularly applies to meat. I'm, my father pioneered industrial chicken production in this country post-war, exactly as you refer to, Tara and Henry. There was a, a desperate concern that we as a country should never be held to ransom again by U-boats in the North Atlantic. And so the demands post-war were produce, produce, produce. And as young farmers, we were paid eye-watering amounts of taxpayers' money to basically intensify. We farmed in the Yorkshire Dales at the time, a high hill farm between 1,000 and 2,000 feet. And we were being paid taxpayers' money to put drainage channels into the steep hillsides, to grip the peat moorland, and to spread fertiliser with a helicopter on land you could hardly walk up. That was government policy post-war. My father, the first chickens he produced post-war, took 53 days to grow a four-pound chicken. It now takes 28 days. When I was a kid, we had 7,000 chickens in a shed on the farm. They now have 100,000. There's a factory near us in Devon processing 3 million chickens a week. While he was alive, he said, 
I never expected that industrialization of the food system to be exponential. And that's the point. We've lost control of where there is a balance between technologies that can be very helpful and looking after and respecting nature. And what has happened is the food system, as Henry talked about earlier, is dominated by a very small number of giant corporates. And they're the ones who keep insisting, grow the chickens faster because drive down the unit cost because we make more money. And in the middle, the farmers have certainly not come out of it well. And that's a, another point that we, we might want to talk about. But it is not individual farmers who are driving this food system. And I think it's something that's very important to allude to. Because if we are going to go back to a system which isn't simply about flooding the world with industrial calories, because we already produce 50% more calories than we need to feed, what, approaching 10 billion people. So it's not like there's a shortage of industrial food, but there's a desperate shortage of balance and control and looking after the role that nature must play. Talking of that on the whole control of the system, uh, I'm just wondering if it'd be interesting to, to bring, bring up the role of supermarkets in the UK. Uh, and also the fact that supermarkets in the UK seem to operate in a slightly different way than European supermarket, and that, that was quite illustrated with the shortage of tomato and peppers and salad we had a few weeks ago, which, yes, it was because of the droughts uh, last, at the end of last summer in, in southern Europe. There was a shortage, but a lot of people have seen pictures of European supermarkets with the, the shelf full, and that's because the supermarket in Europe works differently. They, they will pay the market price, where in the UK they don't. They, they've got a kind of fixed, very low price, driving the price down. We, we, we talked to a, a Belgian co-op tomato grower uh, during the shortage and said, I've got loads of tomato. You know, for the British supermarket, they're just not ready to pay the price, so I'll sell it to the Germans. Um, is, is the way of supermarket operate in the UK a good thing? The fact that it's different is it? Is it? A and that, yeah, I mean that's quite. Uh, during the, the recent sh shortages, uh, I got sent two things from it. One was all the French were complaining about the two euro lettuce, so we had no lettuces, and they their lettuces cost two euros because our supermarkets see a lettuce as being a kind of price signifier, so they keep it at seventy p. And if the price goes down, they refuse to discount it, so farmers are forced to to churn the lettuces into their field because they won't discount it. And if prices go up, they hold the price. And then all of the wholesalers and restaurants go into the supermarkets and clear the shelves, which is why there are shortages. That's why they say, you know when you see the shortages in the supermarket, it says, like, maximum five lettuces. And you go, well, no one's going to need five lettuces. The answer is that the Barra boys are coming in and filling their whole trolley with lettuces and taking them down to the market. So uh, that is, and that's got worse, you know, Aldi and Lidl have come in here and those guys, and th there's ferocious price competition in the UK. But actually, uh, uh, and it, all of that is problematic. I think in the long run, we have to, that the supermarkets are the ones who are least threatened by the transition, because they're going to sell the food anyway. And so... I actually think that you know, the, the ones who are fighting tooth and nail are the processed food companies. They're the ones whom there, there is no way out of this. There is no way that they can sell their food. And so I do think we have problems with supermarkets. I do think that the supermarkets, they're, they're the ones who more often than not to government say, give us a level playing field, give us the legislation, and we will fight. They hate each other. We will fight tooth and claw. Whereas... The processed food company is saying, no, nothing to see here, no problem, because it really is existential for them. They, they can't exist. I, I, in a good food system, they would be a third of the size that they are now, and that's a lot of profit moved to another area of the economy. And Nick, we, we, we talked about fake meat or meat alternative earlier, but uh, what, what role proteins alternative like pearls can play both in terms of diet and for soul health? Pulses. Yeah. Um, so yes, 
I mean, coming back to the question of, of fake meat, I very much agree with Tara that if that's the answer, then we're asking the wrong question. And going back again to something that came up earlier, um, Tara again said that we, we need to learn that we can't just have what we want. More positively, I think we can change what we want. And I think the, it, it's quite a trivial example, but the example of the plastic bag tax does illustrate that. You would have thought from the choices we all made 10, 15 years ago that we all wanted plastic bags. We all wanted to go into the shop and have loads of plastic bags. That's what we were doing. And, and yet that tiny uh, change in taxation has now completely changed what we do and what our habits are. And I don't think people are say, feeling, oh, I wish we could go back to the time when we could have as many plastic bags as we want. I mean, it's, you know, what we want can change. And I think our diet can change, not through being told what we should eat in a, in a sort of dictatorial nanny state kind of way, but through a cultural change that changes the way we value different foods, changes our appreciation of different foods, and through, through a sort of holistic approach to what we eat and awareness of the impact of it and closer connection with where it comes from, we can very much want different things that are better for us and better for the planet. And pulses are a big part of that answer. I think also, coming back to the question of fake meat, I'm, I'm very wary uh, of anything being proposed as, as the solution. There's, no, there's never a silver bullet. And, and when there have appeared to be sort of big answers to problems in the past, they always come with unexpected um, side effects, un unexpected consequences that we then have to clear up the mess of afterwards. And I think um, <coughs> fake meat is, is really, a, runs the risk of, of creating new problems as, as well as being in the control of those very big sort of agribusiness corporates that, that we've been talking about. But pulses uh, and more broadly diversity, um, what I believe really strongly is that we we really need more diversity in, in our farming and in our food. And pulses can be a big part of that diversity in farming. Uh, all arable farmers have arable rotations. They grow a succession of different crops. But because our diets have become so dependent on, on a very limited range of crops, even globally, so across the whole of the world, 75% of our food comes from just 12 different plant species and five different animal species. And in the UK, that's even more narrow. We're, we're essentially feeding ourselves primarily with wheat. Wheat is, is the, the big crop and the big food that goes into most of the processed foods that we eat and, and is also used to feed the, the industrially farmed animals that we eat. If we can get more diversity into crop rotations, then we get significant benefits uh, and if some of that diversity comes from introducing more pulses into the rotation, then we get the, the fantastic benefit of the magical property that leguminous plants have, and pulses are the various seeds of leguminous plants, beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils. Those leguminous plants, with help from the microbes in the soil that Peter talked about, and I hope there's some, some clover or something in his sod there, um, <laughs> leguminous plants, with help from those microbes, have the magical property of, of taking nitrogen from the atmosphere. Excellent. I should put my glasses <laughs> on. I think that's... They, they, they take <laughs> nitrogen from the atmosphere and, and put it into the soil, both for their own requirements in terms of nutrition, uh, uh, soil nutrition, the, the nitrogen that all plants need, <coughs> but they also then leave... Ah, excellent, there's some clover. Uh, <laughs> they also then leave a, a, a fertility legacy for the crops that follow them. And... When, when we're just growing a very narrow range of crops, mainly cereal crops, that's so demanding on the soil and the nutrition that is in the soil and available to those plants that we have... Th those systems require huge inputs, um, chemical inputs to control the pests and diseases, but also uh, fertility inputs. And artificial fertiliser is essentially made from that concentrated sunshine, the fossil fuels. We use the fossil fuels through a process called the Haber-Bosch process to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it into a form where we can put it on the land. We then put too much on the land and it runs off into the, into the watercourses and causes other problems. But if we can move away from that dependence on huge chemical inputs and particularly huge inputs of, of fertiliser, 
then we can significantly reduce the impact, the environmental impact of, of arable farming. And pulses are a, a great way to do that. Getting a leguminous plant into the rotation. Every arable rotation should have pulses somewhere in that rotation. And other farming systems should have leguminous plants like clover in them to, to get that nitrogen out of the atmosphere. And then on the other hand, pulses are also fantastic for us to eat both in terms of health and nutrition. I mean, they are just fantastically nutritious. They're a source of protein, but they're also full of fiber and resistant starch and micronutrients that give us what we need. Uh, obviously, we need a wide range of foods. We can't just exist on pulses, but as part of our diverse diet, they bring huge benefits. So yeah, pulses are definitely something we should be growing and eating more of. Briefly. Very, briefly. very brief very point. Briefly. Very brief point. The point Nick's talking about, diversity in farming, the really exciting and positive news which we're talking about, we need in this debate for farmers to move away from high input industrial systems and go to diversity. There's a guy called Andy Cato who started something called Wild Farm Wheat, good old fashioned heritage wheat, nature friendly farmers. They've proved farmers make more money by stepping back from these high input industrial systems and having diverse rotations, old fashioned traditional rotations, they make more money. And that's a really exciting prospect. I think there's just so many things we can talk about. You know, I'm thinking gene editing, science. Um, but actually, Tara, I just want to quickly uh, ask you something because some in the audience may, may have read uh, about some um, beef system uh, with people claiming that they actually sequestrate more than they produce uh, using often the, the people using mob grazing uh, 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 sometimes uh, claim that they sequestrate more than they produce. Mob grazing, uh, for those who are not familiar with, is, is kind of high, in, uh, high density grazing on a small patch of land and you move them every day, it promotes uh, uh, growth of the, the pasture. Um, and people like Alan Savory and Joel Salatin um, kind of sometimes make big claims about that. Uh, have they found a solution? I mean, uh, Shall I comment on that? So just for those of you who aren't familiar, there is this idea that if you, um, if you kind of mass graze for a very short period of time um, cattle on a small patch of land, um, they will eat, the, eat the, 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 the grass right down to, to its roots and they'll kind of shock the system, shock the grass system, um, causing it to put down deep roots and in so doing, draw down carbon from the atmosphere and by then you've moved the cattle on to another patch of land and you give it time to recover and so the cycle continues. And there have been claims that, um, well, firstly, that grazing animals in this way mimics the actions of wild herbivores um, um, and so you're, you're actually kind of yeah kind of mimicking natural processes and secondly that in doing so you can draw down so much carbon from the atmosphere that some claim that it it could even help uh, 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 the most extreme proponents of this idea claim that you could uh, even reverse uh, climate change um, so, so the evidence there depends on, firstly, what agroecological system you are talking about, where in the world, whether those uh, they are originally grassy landscapes, which where the grassy savanna ecosystems have actually co-evolved with with the animals. So that's the first thing. Not all landscapes uh, are naturally grassland. For example, Britain was, you know, originally forest, and through human intervention. We now have the situation where we have, as you pointed out, Dimitri, in your introduction, very, very little um, forest left. Um, and secondly, that, the, that there is indeed evidence that these systems of management can, um, can lead to the drawing down of carbon from the atmosphere. But, but what happens is that over time, this can happen perhaps in to quite an impressive degree for the first uh, decade or so, of this intervention, but then the the soil gradually, um, the, the kind of the level of carbon in the soil starts to kind of saturate, reach equilibrium. So more carbon in is is kind of countered by carbon going back out. So 
after a period of time, um, it's not sequestering, drawing down more carbon, so it doesn't represent a solution. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think what I would say there is that there's always interesting experimentation to be done with better ways, new ways of grazing animals, and they're always worth looking at. But just as there is, you know, uh, or microbial fermentation is not the solution to anything, nor is mob grazing the solution to everything, because there are so many different things that we need to do. And I think the one other point I would make, again, just to kind of push back um, on the idea that we, we need to um, kind of go back to traditional systems. And again, I agree that we do, but we are, I get back to this point that there are 10 billion of us going to be on this planet. We are in a situation that we have never been in before. And that we may, it may turn out that we have to do some unnatural things to save nature from us. And these won't be choices that we necessarily want to make. It goes against our intuitions. But I, and I think the, the really serious issues are when we ha think about new technologies, the really serious questions to me are about corporate control. And again, the failure to think about what is the problem to which this is a solution? We constantly have to be thinking about what the, what we're actually trying to address. But I don't think we should just um, throw out new ideas and new thinking out of hand. We just can't afford to. And, uh, actually, and I, I wanted to bring GE into the discussion because no, since Brexit, no, we we've signed the the, the royal. Um, uh, I was going to say charter, no, it's the Royal Ascent, uh, uh, which means that we can now do GE in this country quite easily. Um, I, I'd like to do a show of hands. See, if you went to the supermarket and you s bought some potato, it's a uh, genetically engineered potato, who would buy them? So very unscientifically, I would say around 5% of the audience. Um, Henry, sh should we embrace science and new technology? I mean, uh, and the reason I, uh, sorry, uh, sorry for putting you on the spot, but the reason I, I've used potato is because, for example, potato blight, it's a real issue. Yeah. We've been talking about waste. And actually, if somebody like Roth Hampstead can come up with a new GE potato, which means it doesn't get potato blights, we've got far less waste, probably less inputs, Potentially, everybody's a winner, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, uh, genetic editing, uh, most of you probably know, but for those who don't, it is uh, there is a technology called CRISPR, which means that you can cut, very easily cut genes within the same species between different varietals. And the argument for genetic editing is that it's not like genetic modification when you're bringing in a bit of genetic material from a different species, it's simply speeding up the process of breeding. So. We've all referred a little bit to this existential problem that, that we had after the war, uh, where we were going to go from a population of 2.5 billion to 8 billion, and uh, uh, two-thirds of the people on the planet today would not exist without our modern form of farming. That was created by a man called Norman Borlaug, who scuttled about in Mexico between the, 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 the sea and the, and the uplands and created a new form of wheat, which was very high yielding and short stemmed and resistant to wheat rust. The argument is that rather, than he almost, you know, he, he was very lucky to succeed because you just have to keep breeding things and hope that you get the right genes coming in. So the argument for genetic editing material is you just speed up that process. In my mind, without a doubt, that is something in particular for countries that are, for crops like the banana, where you've lost a lot of genetic diversity, uh, in drought-ridden areas, trying to create rice, or trying to create uh, rice paddies that don't need to be wet, so they produce less methane. There are all sorts of applications of this technology that could, as Tara said, you might not, you know, you might not, it might be the first way you go, but if you're going to have 10 billion people on the planet, it would be uh, irresponsible not to investigate those technologies. The other thing I'd say about GE versus GM, which I think is really interesting because the technology is so cheap 
if you look at a country such as Argentina, where it has been possible to, uh, to do this for a, quite a long time, uh, the, the number of patents, the number of new crops that have been created is, f is a huge range of small and medium enterprises, whereas GM, which was highly regulated and more expensive, was controlled by a very small number of corporates. So um, I'm not sure how many GE products we will need in this country, but I think it would be uh, reckless on a colossal scale not to allow uh, people to try and find ways of solving some of the problems of, of feeding ourselves without destroying our bodies and the environment by using that technology. Uh, I'm just wondering if anybody's been convinced by Henry's argument. S does, uh, has anybody didn't raise their hand before who know would buy those GE potatoes to save the planet? Ah. <laughs> we've, made, we, we've made some change tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, you asked the more broadly technology, yes. You, know, you now have drones with AI that can monitor the, the health of every single plant in the field, and thereby you put on less nitrogen, you put on less um, uh, pesticide. There are all sorts of ways. We, we, there, there's now a, a trial being done to measure the amount of carbon uh, in soil using the same technology that you use to measure oil, to find out if oil is there. So there are all sorts of amazing ways in which science is going to stop us using so many chemicals and using and, and reduce carbon that we use. I'm, I'm going to start. Th there's just so many things we can still talk about, but I, I do want to give you the opportunity to ask a few questions as well. I'm going to start asking questions. I'm assuming there's a roving mic somewhere. I'll, I'll start, yeah, at the back there. So wh why don't we start with the gentleman over here? Before he asks his question, I will ask one from uh, Chris Payne, who sent a question online. Uh, I'll bring this to Nick. Uh, what's actual practical measures, political, market-based or social, would you absolutely prioritize to begin to better align what we eat with the environmental imperative? So I think briefly, we, we need to stop subsidizing uh, industrial um, food production and food processing. That, that, that just needs to go. And we, we talked earlier about the, the cost of food. The cost needs to reflect the true cost of production and the externalities, and we need to change that. We also need taxation to disincentivize the production and the selling of the wrong, the wrong type of food that's damaging the environment and that also damages us. So when we're faced with choices, choosing what food to buy, we're, we're making the choice on the basis of what, what the true cost of the food is um, to us individually, to the farmer that grows it, but also to society more widely. Gentleman over there. So, um, you've yes. obviously Could described you start with your name, uh, and Timothy. Name? Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you've obviously described a very complex system that needs to be changed. But I want to pick one element that I don't want to let the quote unquote consumer off the hook on. There is a dynamic between the grocery stores and the consumers making choices about what they buy that does affect the behavior of the rest of the market. And of course, one really good example I'd love you to comment on was Whole Foods grocery store in the US brought together food producers, ranchers, the FDA, PETA, to develop a one through five scale about meat from highly industrialized to barely touched. They then started to label all of their meat one through five and offer that at different price points to consumers to try to give a reasonable market-driven approach to how to change behavior. Very mixed results because consumers just in the end wanted to pay 99p for their ground beef and weren't willing to spend 299 or 399 for a level four. So this interface between the consumer and the grocery store and looking for innovative market driven opportunities to make those changes, why isn't there more of that going on in the UK? Because that's where you're going to get things to do if you can get the market to respond to signals that are being sent. 
feet. So you, you sell direct to the consumer, do you? Yeah, we do. And this morning down in Devon, I was getting absolutely drenched by an April shower as we were trying to make a piece of video for our Instagram feed and it was demonstrating our version of mob grazing. And it's interesting, Tara, because actually it differs slightly from the one you described. We are moving our bullocks out of a section with that much forage left. And the reason we leave that much is because those are the solar panels to nourish the soil biology. And in 50 days time, we come back again when hopefully it's up here. But we're saying our job is to look after the soil biology because, as I said earlier, nature is the most powerful resource we have on the planet to produce food. The second part, so information is king, but real information, not a simplistic label that somebody might take 2.3 seconds to make a purchasing decision. Real information, which in a digital age is very achievable. I know there's a plethora of maybe misleading information, but I would say our customers are discerning enough to really dig deep and get the facts. Just the other point I would make is the technology which empowers customers to actually scan every piece of food to measure nutritional value is very close and that's the game changer. Doesn't matter what the label says. When you can actually measure nutritional density, you are almost definitely getting a window into the system of production. And crucially, it is a game changer when, when customers realize the very direct link between what they stick in their mouth and everything about their well-being, from, from mental health to physical health and everything in the middle is dictated by the quality and nutritional value of what you stick in your mouth. And if you can measure that on an iPhone, suddenly the food system is going to have to be very careful not to simply label industrial foods as having nutritional value that it simply doesn't. Uh, we're going to take a question from there in a minute, but first a question from online from Selena. Um, there has been a lot of discussion so far about how we should be shopping and what we should be eating. But what about the 27% of people in the UK who skipped a meal in March 2023 uh, who had very limited choices? How can we make sure this debate is about sustainable for people as well as the planet? That's probably one for you, Henry. Yeah, so I think that there are two things going on here. We have the most unequal, one of the most unequal societies in the Western world, and um, uh, uh, environmentally and health-destroying foods are not a long-term solution to the problem of poverty. So we need to sort out poverty. In the meantime, there are things that you can do to help people who are really struggling. Food insecurity has doubled since last year, and the government should be increasing the um, threshold on free school meals, which you only get uh, £7,400 household income, increasing Healthy Start, and rolling out schemes which actually give, which Alexander Rose are doing in Hackney, incredible schemes, giving access to fruit and veg to families in poverty. But you can't, we can't go on using cheap food as the way that we deal with poverty in society, because that is literally not sustainable. Okay, a question from here, and then we'll go to the gentleman here at the front. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Victoire, and I am a sustainability executive uh, working in the corporate sustainability function of a large UK supermarket. Um, I think a lot about what it's going to take to transform our food system. Um, and Tara, you mentioned that we need to be imagining new ways forward to our problems. Um, and I completely agree. I think the change we need lies in pursuing novel methods and approaches that are outside conventional corporate practices and BAU. And I don't think we can expect to escape the system feedback loop you talk about, Henry, or drive meaningful food system transformation without first focusing on transform transforming the businesses that have committed to and are working towards delivering this change. The transformation must also be internal and cultural. Um, and I think that to drive this change, it needs to come from the top down, but also the bottom up, through kind of younger sustainability executives, um, bringing in question? their perspectives. Yeah, sorry, I am. My question to you is, um, what are your thoughts on the importance of cultural transformation 
um, and bringing new ideas and perspectives into the conversation, like younger executives that can provide innovative solutions to the systems that we face. And for example, someone being able to sit on a panel like this and bring in that kind of youth perspective and that, that new idea and kind of brave, brave approach. <coughs> Which supermarket are you from? Um, I'd rather not stay, no. but... <laughs> <laughs> Can I, if, if she won't say which supermarket, I don't think it matters hugely because I think you'd lump them all into the same boat. On the way up from Devon, there was a very interesting question posed to the president of the CBI talking about their current woes. And he said, the problem we have with our culture is we have too many layers of middle management so information does not travel up and down the corporate structure. And I thought, you know what? That is the problem with the farming corporate food industry. If we go back to farmers who genuinely are closest to nature being connected with the top of the food supply system, problem solved. When you have a corporate structure with all of these separations between the big the big bosses making corporate decisions, they are so far removed from the basic, incredible wonder of nature, that is a massive cultural problem. Uh, quick question for Tara from Nicola here online. Question for Tara, when food uh, originates in a lab and not in the soil, what, uh, where are we getting all micronutrients from? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And I, you know, I, I have to say that I, I, I am not, I'm not an advocate of lab meat. I just feel that we need to keep lots of things um, bubbling away to, as, as solutions. I think with the micronutrients, this is a real concern that I have, if they, they have to be added in, and, and my, my concern with them is that um, the complexity of a, of a real food grown in the real soil can never, uh, I, I can't see how it could be replicated by, by growing something in a lab. But I come back to my point that we seem to, that the question is kind of predicated on the assumption that we can have it all. And we may only be able to get just about good enough and and it may be that our health is going to take a hit we have to make a choice between the the, the long-term viability of the future totally super duper bright-eyed bushy-tailed optimal health or something that just just about works out for 10 billion people and I, I would love it if it was if we could have win-win-win all round but I fear that that might not be possible Gentlemen at the front here, and then we'll go to the lady here over there. Hi, this is Mrs. Jones. I'm a very old hack and a author. And my question to you is to Mr. Dimbleby and Mr. Greg, but to the panel as well. Both of you spoke about the uh, virtues of the pre-industrial age. The only politician, major politician of the last eight years to advocate that was a Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, or half-naked fakir, to use the words of Winston Churchill. Um, and even in his own country, that was not followed, apart from in instituting, um, banning uh, the uh, consumption of alcohol. Um, India went for industrial growth. The Green Revolution of the 60s, much pursued by the Johnson administration and so on. How are you going to convince the villages in India, and I've been to the villages in India, which don't believe in using dung to make their houses, as Gandhi would have wanted them, which are using television to watch the Premier League, unfortunately Manchester United and not my club, but that's a different story. Um, how are you going to persuade them? That, and, and what are you going to say? And I don't me mean to put this question to you in a hostile way in any way. What are you going to say to them? And India is now the largest, uh, most populated country in the world, and very proud of it when India wanted family planning and all that, that this is not another Eurocentric view, having profited from the Industrial Revolution, you are now lecturing the rest of the world and saying, no, no, you can't do that. I'm not saying you're doing that, but I'm just asking you, how are you going to do that? So, uh, two, two things. First of all, the, the strategy that I did, I was always very clear that the work that I was doing was 
uh, uh, a strategy for England. How do we in the UK feed ourselves without destroying the planet here and abroad and without destroying our health? And it is relevant for uh, Western countries more broadly, but it, there are a whole bunch of questions around uh, food security, food sovereignty uh, in countries like India, which I am not an expert on. I think that more broadly, the question that you're asking is, um, are we denying, which is a much, much bigger question in the food system, are we denying people in developing countries the opportunity to be as comfortable to enjoy the things that we enjoy? Um, for me, the only hope in that front is at the moment is solar energy, which is collapsing so quickly in cost, it's much way beyond food, that you can actually, there is one potential way forward, that energy costs collapse and stuff becomes, uh, stuff that consumers want becomes less environmentally damaging. Almost you could get a case where if solar co cost comes down hugely, that we have a huge, in the Northern Hemisphere, we have huge excesses of energy in the summer that we can use to make stuff. But I'm, that is, that is, uh, beyond, was beyond the scope of what I did, and certainly by my pay grade. By the way, I think I was a very young journalist uh, at, at your newspaper uh, when I was uh, my second job, so uh, and I looked up to you enormously. And there's a question quite similar, actually, from the uh, delightful Felicity Cloak, actually. Uh, uh, do we in the global north have the right to advise emerging economies on their growing but still tiny consumption when this problem is almost entirely down to our own ongoing history of overconsumption? Should we be the one making the change, not them? I, I think if I could answer, because I think your question here was directed at me too, and I, I think. Uh, I, too, am not an expert in India by any means. I've never been there. I think there are two things that I would point out, though. One, I think I'm right in saying there was considerable uh, protest by the farming sector when there was a suggestion there would be top-down political imposition of sort of forcing the farming industry to become part of the global commodity pricing structure. That is fundamentally the cause of a lot of our problems. The food system globally, I believe, should be regionalized. We should be looking at what are the resources of different areas of the planet and optimizing the use of those but that, again, I think, is why I unashamedly suggest we need to go back to the wisdom that's handed down through generations of smaller farmers who really knew how to optimise the use of resources before there were industrial inputs. And that is why I believe it is worth saying, look, those smaller farmers in India, they have a very important voice in this discussion because they are closer to the natural resources of that part of the world. The other point I would make is that I think the increase in demand for material goods, which is what you're alluding to, yes, that has sort of flooded the Western world. Whether that actually is what our grandson will reflect on as being the way to satisfy life. And I think that farming in harmony with nature, agroecology, the farmers should be closely integrated with societal goods, health, education. Those young people should be part of a landscape farmed in harmony with nature. And that is very different from being excluded from an industrial landscape where there are signs up saying biosecure area, nobody admitted. But, but, uh, Peter, do you think that is slightly, I mean, I, I don't think we should, Felicity, but I think that is, so if you take Egypt, for example, Egypt already has a population because of the way in which we have, this very much tomorrow's point about what we'd like and what, and what we have to do. Egypt, because we've got very good at storing and transporting food, has a population that is now twice as large as any possible estimate of what of the food it could produce from its own land because we feed it from Ukraine, we feed it from Russia, 
And in the next 50 years, that population is going to double again. So I, do, I, I don't think that there is a one-size-fits-all. I don't think you can apply. You know, I think Egypt, as soon as it becomes economically viable, Egypt will have huge solar-powered protein plants making alternative fermented protein because uh, it's, you know, it's scaring the life. You know, we worry about our food costs going up. They have uh, almost half the country living in poverty, and they import 75% of their wheat from Ukraine and Russia. They are in... They're on the brink of societal collapse. So I think you've got to be really careful of applying one, one part of the world's Yeah, I, to I totally problem. agree, but I'm just making the point it is not a one-size-fits-all. Fit we should not be looking at a globalised food system. We should regionalise, and if sunshine is a hugely available resource, then solar energy is something that they can produce in abundance in Egypt. But the grain which is shipped to... Egypt, to satisfy that huge demand, should be produced without massive fossil fuel supplies. Mm -hmm. yep. So yep. let us not, I mean, fossil fuel should not underpin production of food anywhere in the world, frankly. But the, the you know, recognising that what I'm describing, it's not a but fantasy land. Peter, it's got to be if realistic. you don't use fossil fuel, then you don't have the fertiliser. Well, no, because you, you might get solar-produced fossil fuel. It might be a way of, of hacking right. the Harbour Bosch process. But, but, but also, Harbour Bosch, right. Harbour Bosch totally destroys the power of the soil biology to harness the energy of the sun. Why is that a good idea? It simply doesn't make any sense to use tonnes of energy to produce nitrogen fertiliser. It, if you look at the carbon calculation of that, it makes no sense. If you look at the power of soil biology to harness energy of the sun, which is a bit like solar energy in Egypt, the power of that is immense. It's unlimited because it's harnessing the energy of the sun. Production of uh, industrial fertiliser makes no sense on any level in my book. It just doesn't. And the farmers who have learned, like Andy Cato with Wild Farm Grain, to move away from it and to go back to farming with traditional diverse rotations, harnessing the power of soil biology, they don't need the fertiliser and they make more money. It's not quite Andy's yields, it's Andy's yields are organic yields. For he filled farms and strips with half being wheat and half being legumes and clover. His yields are organic yields, which are about 30% less than... So than than industry produce yields. So at the moment, we do. If you were to like, look at what happened in Sri Lanka, if you were to re remove now industrial fertilizer, you would lead to mass starvation. So I think there is. It's not quite as simple as going back to organic rotating. Uh, I think you, you both made yeah. your point very well. Question <laughs> question over there. Hello. Hi, my name is India, um, and I'm another young person here. I just turned 20, and I'm very passionate about all these subjects that we've covered here, and I find it like exciting because it's both terrifying, but also there are hundreds of solutions in the farming and food world. Um, and I just wanted to touch on one aspect of it that I think we didn't really go deep into um, in terms of a solution um, of redefining our value system and perhaps kind of redefining our um, the way that we see beauty in things in terms of food waste and kind of how we can build that more into um, both as indi as individuals and as corporations like how we can build waste as part of that value system and maybe alluding to like a circular economy and how we can kind of progress towards that because I just I mean, I think a lot of young people would feel the same that like we wake up every day kind of in one way or another thinking about the climate um, anxiety that is present at the moment. But there are so many solutions out there and we want to be doing things about it. And like, how can we do that as well? <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to go next? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I think you're absolutely right. And it, it's part of what I, I tried to touch on when I said that we can change what we want. And I guess for... For, for those of you who are young rather than those of us who are from older generations, you can sort of come into adulthood wanting different things from what we have wanted. And, and referring back to the earlier question, I think it, it is incumbent on us in the global north to demonstrate that we can change because we have messed things up and we, we can't, the way of life that we have come to, to 
expect and come at the moment to appear to want is not sustainable. We can't, we can't carry on like that. And we certainly can't afford to sort of demonstrate to the rest of the world that that's the way to live and that's, that's what people should aspire to all over the world. So I, I think there's a, a lot of hope in, in what you're suggesting that values can change, culture can change, food waste, you know, our attitude to food waste, we just need to see waste. We, we've, I think those of us in older generations, we've, we've, we're blind to waste. We just don't notice it. We don't, you know, and, and it, should, it should be there in our, in our heads and in our face and it should be horrifying us, disgusting us and thereby changing our value system so we don't live in a way that, that creates that sort of waste. And, and so, you know, in a similar way with all the other values that we've been talking about. I'm just going to take one last question because after we, we need to uh, um, leave the auditorium. So I'll take one more question from the lady over there. I'm um, very sorry for everybody else. My name's Anna-Marie Julian um, and I'm a freelance food journalist. I write regularly for Waitrose Weekend. Um, and my question is, how do we ignore the role of convenience? Because if we're going to eat and prepare whole foods, then we need time. Peter? I, uh, <laughs> okay, very briefly. I, uh, although Piper's Farm has been going 33 years, I think probably the most important thing Henry and I have ever created is presentation of our product in a convenient way. I think 70% of what we get out of bed every day to do is provide convenience, just because that is the way society is. I have a slightly outspoken view that I think the supermarket system, and you suggested earlier, Henry, supermarkets are here to stay. I think the supermarket system of retail is history. I think it is just mad because it is so dysfunctional because it's driving this unsustainable corporate globalised food system and this race to the bottom on price. I think it's incredibly exciting, both of those last questions. It's your generation, as Nick says. I'm afraid we've screwed it up, us lot. Thank God Will and Abby are now driving the next vision of Piper's Farm. It's your generation who are going to completely reimagine the way that the food supply chain needs to work and you will drive it and be bold and don't think the supermarket model is part of the infrastructure, the, the furniture going forward, because it's nuts. It has crushed the farming industry in this country. My final point, I think, you mentioned the, uh, the woes of, of Sri Lanka going totally organic cold turkey overnight. I'm totally with you, Henry. That sort of speed of change doesn't happen. We've been on this planet half a million years. The bats flying around our hedges have been here 60 million years. Let us be patient. Let us, though your generation, have a vision of where we need to get to, which undoes the unsustainable current status quo, if you like. But be very positive and optimistic, because you guys, I'm sorry we screwed it up, but I'm damn sure you're going to sort it out. And nature, look after nature, and nature will help you sort it. You'll sort it out, and you'll screw up something else for your kids. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's all we've got time for tonight. I'm very sorry for everybody else for their, their hands up and there's much, uh, many more questions online as well. Very sorry uh, we couldn't get to everybody. Um, but the food season at the British uh, Library continues. There's a lot more amazing events, uh, so do check the website for what's coming up. Um, I'd like to thank the British Library for to set this thing up, uh, this uh, uh, talk up, and especially uh, the amazing Angela Clutton here who's been curating all those events. Uh, uh, and thank you all of you here for coming and for those of you joining us online, thank you as well. Um, and, and there's a lot more we could have uh, covered today, which uh, you, we could have spent a week here. Um, but uh, um, I, I would highly recommend Henry's book, actually, uh, Ravenous, uh, because it covers more or less every single point we've talked about tonight. Uh, it's actually available to buy it. I'll be signing it outside yeah. if anyone wants to buy it. Uh, and and uh, Peter as well has got his book there, I think. Uh, Peter's uh, book's for I've cut from Peter's book. Yeah, I good. hope you don't mind if I sign Abby's book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but for now, uh, thank you to my panel, Henry, Tara, Nick and Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs>